Well, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here uh, today. My name is Ernie Bauer. I'm the, uh, the chair for Southeast Asian Studies here at uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, for those of you who haven't been here yet, um, um, I hope you enjoy the new building. Uh, for those of you who had been to the old building, this is, uh, it's nice to see sunlight uh, while you're speaking about uh, important topics uh, related to development, uh, uh, economic uh, issues, geopolitics, and whatnot. So it, um, thank you all for coming. This is a special treat, and uh, it's actually a, a little bit of an emotional uh, time for, for those of us who are um, really good friends with, uh, with Dino Dijal, the ambassador of Indonesia. As you know, this is a man whose uh, heart uh, was, was in the job. He is um, he's a, a incredible uh, leader, uh, thoughtful, compassionate, um, and in, in, in typical form, I think, instead of having a, a going away party, uh, what he thought we should do is um, get some of the best minds on development together and try to get some advice before he goes back to Indonesia. And if you haven't heard yet, um, this is a guy who's running for president of, uh, of the uh, Republic of Indonesia. So uh, it's a guy who, who deeply cares about these issues and wants to apply them. You. Um, and it, I thought that was just so apropos, uh, given, uh, given um, Dino's uh, focus. You know, he doesn't want to. Uh, have another party. He wants to focus on how he can improve the country, and I, and I thought that was incredibly. Uh, it was it was not only smart, but it, it tells you a lot about the man. I'm going to ask him to uh, say a couple words, and then we've gathered with us today uh, some of the some of the best minds on development and uh, prospects for pro poor uh, technologies in development de developing countries. What to do, uh, what's out there, how to apply it, um, and I hope all of you. I, I've met many of you coming in. Uh, I hope all of you will engage in uh, discussion uh, after we hear their brief comments. That's the idea today, is to get some good ideas for um, Padina before he heads back. So, without further ado, um, please join me in thanking Dino for his leadership while he's here, and then I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you. I'll speak from here and again on behalf of the Indonesian Embassy and my wife who's a bit overdressed here. <laughs> she, she just came from uh, an event, uh, uh, Embassy event. And, and Ernie, thank you so much for, for having the, this forum. And we, you know, we had, and Murray, uh, thank you. Uh, and everybody, it's, it's great to see you here. And uh, I see a lot of friends from uh, Indonesia, uh, Indonesianists who are here. Again, welcome. Uh, and you know, when we discuss uh, what kind of seminar we would have. I mean, the original idea was to have uh, something on Indonesia. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, that was a nice idea, but I thought uh, to, to go into a theme which I've always been interested in, which is uh, not just technology, but pro poor technology, uh, is something that uh, would, uh, would be something that I would learn a lot from and I would find uh, very useful uh, as well. Um, um, a few years ago, I met an Indonesian woman who studied in America. Her name is Trimum Puni, and she studied energy and a little bit of hydropower. Uh, and then after that, she went back home and she championed a movement uh, to create independent micro hydro energy villages throughout Indonesia. Uh, she realized that in Indonesia we have a lot of water, a lot of rivers, right, a lot of rain, uh, and she found a way to turn them into energy and made villages energy independent, right? And I thought, wow, that's incredible. You know, one simple technology, simple innovation, and it helped the poor. Uh, it's just a question of how to replicate it in a way that would meet the economic scale of Indonesia. That remains the challenge. And then I met another guy in Indonesia. His name was Johannes Surya. He's a maverick uh, educa educator. And uh, what he did was he went to Papua and found uh, the most remote school uh, in a place where the students uh, had uh, scored the lowest in national tests. Right? 
I mean, you couldn't get any lower than the students at this most remote school in Papua in terms of academic achievement. So he took them in, uh, uh, educated them in his institute, and he had a very innovative uh, teaching in math and science and physics, right? And he took them for about one year, and after two years, they began to top the national test scores. And after that, he sent these Papuan kids to the International Science Olympiads, I think in Poland or something, you know, and they won the gold medal, right? So talent is everywhere, yeah? Uh, talent is everywhere, no matter what your uh, economic status or ethnic background is. Uh, it's just that uh, they're not exposed to the right opportunity and right tools. Uh, and same story with my dad. My dad in the 1950s, uh, he was from the most remote part of uh, West Sumatra. And there was no TV, no electricity, no radio. Uh, no cars, no motorcycles uh, for when, where he was, and he had to travel to Jakarta in the 50s and all the way to America, University of Virginia, to gain knowledge. You know, the, he studied the law of the sea and he, he gained his doctorate degree. But back then, to gain that knowledge, he had to travel halfway around the world and had to be the smartest kid in his community. Otherwise, there was no opportunity. And what happens now? What happens now is somebody in his village only needs to click a few buttons on the computer to gain the same amount of uh, articles, essays, and, and legal documents that he had to uh, travel halfway around the world for. So, you know, technology does do a lot for the poor. I can say, tell you this. Uh, we take email for granted now, you know, uh, Twitter and Facebook. But you know what that does to the poor? Uh, the poor felt poor and felt desperate because they were marginalized and they felt the universe was away from them. They were away from anything that was good in the world that made them feel helpless you know, and far away and desolate, right? But the poor now has access to emails. And the email, when you register for Yahoo or Gmail, it doesn't ask you what nationality you are. It doesn't ask you uh, how, you know, how old and things like that. It doesn't discriminate you. Right? You have total emancipation to uh, your personal email access and also to Twitter and Facebook and everything. And you have no idea what this does to the mindset of the poor. He or she feels that he is empowered. He may be poor, yeah? But he's connected, he or she is connected, you know? Uh, and he, does, he or she does not feel marginalized the way that previous generations did. So this is some examples of what the technology does uh, to, uh, to the poor, uh, in, not just in Indonesia, but across the developing world. Uh, so I definitely, I strongly believe that in the 21st century, the technology will be the game changer. Uh, if you ask me what are the drivers for change in the 21st century, I know CSIS has these seven, what do you call it, uh, or seven, seven, revolutions. seven revolutions. Definitely one of them will be uh, technology. And the nice thing uh, is this. Uh, for us uh, policymakers who are looking for the right technology for our problems, the technology are out there. It's not something that you need to invite, invent as in the past. The technology and the innovations are all out there already. But we just don't know where they are and how to access them and how to implement them and integrate them into our development strategy. In Indonesia, we too have a lot of technology. We have the Minister for Research and Technology. But uh, I admit that technology is not placed central in our development strategy and is definitely not placed central in the fight against poverty. Uh, Bono uh, says that uh, extreme poverty will end by 2028, right? Because that's what the graph shows. Uh, from 40%, uh, it's gone down to 20% now. Uh, and if the graph continues to go down by 2028, extreme poverty uh, will be alleviated throughout the world. Uh, I believe if we can employ the right pro-poor technology uh, and uh, governments throughout the world do that, I think we can beat that even uh, faster.
So this is the purpose of our meeting today, just to compare notes, uh, to find out uh, what is the best model, how do governments uh, uh, should adapt uh, technology to their development challenges, uh, and I look forward to uh, really learning from all these distinguished speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dino, and uh, really looking forward to, uh, to digging in here. Um, our first speaker is uh, Asif Sheikh. He's the co-founder of International Resources Group, um, IRG. For those of you in town, uh, you would know the, the acronym really well. Uh, I didn't realize uh, until uh, we, we talked uh, before this conference that he had recently retired from that, uh, from that role. Uh, but I will tell you that um, he, was the, he built that company from the ground up. He ran it for uh, over two decades, and it was a real uh, innovator in the area of development. Uh, I've known him for years, and I'm really looking forward to hearing his comments. I think you all have his background in your handouts, so I won't go into deep detail on, on him or any of the other speakers. But I'd like uh, to ask him to talk a little bit about social media and knowledge sharing and the impact that has on the agenda that the ambassador laid out for us today. Thank you, Ernie, and uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Um, Mr. Ambassador, you uh, much more eloquently than I could uh, just gave my talk. Uh, so as I sit before you, I share your sense of anticipation about what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, but uh, I want to really address two things, and I, I think, Your Excellency, you, you were right on the heart of the matter. Uh, one thing is the concept of donors as minority shareholders. And you alluded to the fact that these things, these technologies exist. They are there. They are playing a role. And we don't even need to go out and get them. They will come and reach us. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And then to address uh, what you so rightly focused on, which is what is the greatest resource in any country in the world? Human capital. If you can change human capital, especially if you can improve the lot and access to knowledge and information for the poor, then you have transformed the world. You have transformed that country. And technology today, in ways that you know, should still astound us, but as of five years ago, they no longer astound us. And five years from now, things that astound us now will seem so old hat. Facebook, you mentioned that. There are 1.2 billion users of Facebook in the world. And the world's third largest country in terms of number of Facebook users is Indonesia. That cannot, and there's some proportion going to be women and girls, some proportion men and boys, but that cannot but cause people, give people the opportunity not to just be told things, but to actually reach out and to seize ideas, to have ideas about rights, to gain opportunity, to build friendships, to build networks, to know what's being served at the Beacon restaurant tonight, if they so desired. And Facebook is already outmoded. Uh, people say it's very yesterday, and there are new tools, uh, Insta something or the other, and, and other tools Instagram. that Instagram. Yeah, I thought it was Insta. I have teenagers. You have teenagers, <laughs> right. Uh, Instapop and, 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 and other things that we probably wish didn't exist. Uh, but these are transforming lives. I grew up at a time when having a six-month-old Sears catalog was connectivity because you knew something about what was happening in the rest of the world. Now, the Arab Spring, however it turns out, almost happened or did happen on Facebook, on Twitter, on internet, cell phones, etc. The second Iranian revolution almost happened on Twitter. So these are forces for good and for evil, but ultimately, they are forces that will be the most transformational in the history of the world because they give hundreds of millions and soon billions because the technology itself is trivially cheap 
equal access to knowledge and to ideas and the ability to communicate, to share, and to organize as uh, those of us in the West have. So uh, I see this movement accelerating. I've been spending the last decade uh, studying uh, changes in, uh, in technology and how they are affecting life. And we as minority shareholders, and I will end very quickly with this point and look forward to a discussion. The donor community is a tiny minority shareholder. Even governments are minority shareholders in the process of development. Most of the forces that will shape the future of developing countries, people, will come from the private sector, will come from business, will come from investment. And so we have to rethink our role and forget about past roles where we believed that the sum of projects was equal to development. It never was. It certainly is not now. And we have to understand that you can't well, you can redirect a river by redirecting its flow, by using the power of its own flow. But you can't just pick it up and put it somewhere else because that's where you want it to be. So there is a power to the flow of the private sector and the global economy. We can help redirect it by using and harnessing that power and trying to make the outcomes better for the poor. But we cannot simply do what we want and have that change society by itself. So let me leave you with that thought. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I'd like, it, actually very apropos, if you look at one of the slides or the, the, the key points in our CSIS 7 Revolutions presentation, it shows a graph, uh, oh, and, it, and that graph shows the uh, two uh, inter intersecting uh, uh, lines and the line that's going down is government's share of development spend in the world, and the line that's going up and crossing it is the uh, ro the share of private sector spending uh, on development in the world. and And I think a lot of that comes from really thoughtful NGOs um, like uh, World Vision, and we're really lucky to have Mr. Lou August, who's the global co-leader for um, information uh, communication technology at uh, World Vision International. So, Lou, uh, please. Thanks, Ernie. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And thank you all for coming today. It's uh, needless to say, this is my favorite topic, and I'm tickled to death that this is going to be a major part of, of why you're going back to Indonesia and what you hope to do for your people. It's what I've devoted my life to since I got out of college, how many years ago? Too, too many years ago. And uh, I've seen technology do amazing things for youth. Uh, back in the early 1980s, I started a company that provided technology to U.S. schools in a number of states. And I saw how technology empowered youth who, were, who had no opportunities, who were in rural, rural areas, who really were disenfranchised from the U.S. system, and suddenly put them on a fast track to doing really well. Huge, huge employment opportunities, and I saw those opportunities go global when the internet uh, came along. So uh, I absolutely applaud your direction. And, and uh, for myself and for World Vision, we really, want, we really want to do everything we can to support you. Uh, maybe a little bit of background on World Vision. We're a, a large international development organization. Uh, I think we're one of the largest, one of the largest, if not the largest now. We operate in about 100 countries, about 45,000 staff. We, have, we operate out of 38 locations uh, in uh, Indonesia. And uh, we're heavily involved in Indonesia in the areas of education, in economic development, and uh, in health. And increasingly, that involves, for us, uh, working with the government. And in fact, that's an increasingly important part of our strategy, especially in education technology. Because what we've learned when trying to improve an education system is that we can't act alone as an NGO. We have to be working with the entity who's really, it's their job to, 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 to improve education for their people, and that's the government. How can we support the government itself in its role in, in uh, delivering an education? And uh, to do that, we partner with ministries, ministries of education, health, agriculture, economic development, often looking to get alignment between the economic and the education aspects of the ministries. Uh, we work with the multilaterals, the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, 
others so that we're really maximizing each other's investment to get a maximum impact on, uh, on child well-being outcomes, uh, youth's ability to gain a basic education. Uh, certainly with the uh, development agencies, the, the USAIDs and the AUSAIDs and, and all of those are, are major uh, partners of ours in education and also the corporations. Uh, just today I was on a call with Microsoft and, uh, and they're one of many companies we work with and we're all looking at how do we maximize each other's uh, impact to improve uh, education in the world. And it's really, it's really out of the desire to help, certainly for the NGOs, but the corporations as well, and, uh, and of course for the government agencies. We're really all on the same team, and I think that's something I'm, I'm particularly excited about. Uh, I was encouraged to focus on a, on a particular type of technology for the talk today. Uh, World Vision over the course of the last 20 years really has been involved in delivering technology to schools. But really, the technologies to help the most poor are really at an exciting point right now. Uh, I think we're all aware of, of what, what desktop computers did in this country, but that became an, a challenge for countries with poor power or intermittent power. The computers would shut down and it really wasn't a good platform. Uh, when the internet came out, that's great, but you have to have stable power for it to work. And then you get laptops, but oftentimes those were too expensive for communities, especially in uh, poorer rural areas. And then the advent of the tablet came out. And that, that's, it started to get exciting, especially for the poor in, in those areas. And you started seeing large investments by governments. Mexico recently made an announcement uh, for, for tablets. Uh, Kenya, we've been working closely with the Kenyan government on the Jubilee Laptop Program to provide a laptop for every child uh, in Kenya. You know, really exciting uh, initiatives. And so we're finding that these new platforms are really able to provide extremely cost-effective technology into rural areas such that they are affordable for children. We're doing a pilot with uh, Harvard, some folks from Harvard University now, where the cost to use technology for a child in primary school to use technology is less than $10 a year. And that's providing one-to-one -one access to a device. This is a tablet device. And what we're doing in this pilot is using uh, Every child in the classroom gets a tablet computer. And you'll note that I'm taking the word Android out of the tablet equation because it's not just Android now. Microsoft's getting into this space. I think we're going to see a real you know, positive for the developing world war go on between the platforms and the tablets because this is really becoming an exciting platform for delivery. And you shrink a tablet down and you give it some, uh, some wireless capability and then you have a phone. So now phones become the, a platform for education. And so that's, this is a, a, an exciting area that the, where the competition is re really heating up and the beneficiaries are going to be the, 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 the poor of our world and the poor of Indonesia. So I'm really excited about that. But it's not just the cost of the device, it's not just the richness of the device. How good can it deliver content? How rich can that media be? How captivating is the curriculum to be able to teach subjects that are even difficult? It's also what language is it in? Is it in Indonesian? Is it in the 700 or so languages, I believe, that are in Indonesia? And, and if we're not careful, we'll do to Indonesia and other countries what we did to America. We'll make the wonderful fabric of our societies extinct because there was one dominant society in place. And, and um, I'm very aware of that because I worked with our Native American nations in the Pacific Northwest. I think that's an exciting, another exciting opportunity for technology because of the handheld laptops, Microsoft, in fact, has announced a system called Checkoff that allows somebody with a mobile phone to author books, not in English or in Indonesian, but in, I think there's a Sumatran and a Javan, in any language that's capable of being represented by a character set. Suddenly that's an explosion of learning content and a capturing of the rich fabric of human culture that still exists in so many countries in the world and unfortunately doesn't exist in this country anymore. So I, I, another exciting thing. And finally, it's the delivery of content. So nowadays, uh, to get content on your device, you need internet access, which can be expensive. If you want it on your phone, that 3G wireless data plan is even more expensive. So how are you going to get around that? Well, a couple of really exciting things. One is the ability to serve up content locally. These local Wi-Fi systems, which are previously quite expensive, are now down under $100 to deliver two terabytes of content as though you have a giant mainframe in your village that costs $50 and can provide literally two terabytes of content to the local village community off of Wi-Fi for a $50 box. 
These, con these technologies are out there and, and, they're, and they're getting stronger. And the last one for broadcast, I think we, a lot of us have heard of it, is the TV white space phenomena. That's the, that's the, that's the broadcast frequency between broadcast existing frequencies. It's unused. And it turns out that those, many of those frequencies have the ability to carry for long distances. So you can cover vast regions for next to nothing. And so we're going to be seeing over the next 10 years, 5 years, 2 years, a dramatic decrease in the cost of wireless data. And that's going to be another huge enabler of, of education and bringing that rich content to every child in Indonesia. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I, let's dial in a little bit further uh, to stick with the, the cell phone uh, analogy here uh, and talk uh, uh, with Kai Schmitz, who's the uh, Senior Investment Officer in the Telecommunication Media and Technology Department of the International Finance Corporation. And Kai has had uh, very hands-on experience with um, how phones uh, and technology work in in terms of global um, payment systems and local payment systems. Uh, and I wonder if you could uh, share some of your uh, insights with us, Kai. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation and um, I appreciate the opportunity. We invest in the private sector, so as such I'm by definition a strong believer in private sector initiatives for development and otherwise. Um, and I was asked to talk a little bit about some of the examples that we see in our area where technology has been applied to create significant change. And I think the, the prime example that one probably has to start from these days is something that's called M-Pesa, which is a mobile payment service in Kenya. And I remember eight, eight nine years ago, I ran into somebody at a conference in Frankfurt showing me on a laptop this model of a, a mobile wallet, a mobile payment instrument that he wanted to use in Kenya and uh, he thought was a fantastic breakthrough. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, this is nice, but this is Kenya, this is going to take forever to take off, how is he going to get that into everybody's hands, the phones are not there and so on. So I was kind of negative, I think, about the whole environment. Today, M-Pesa, which is run by Safaricom, which is the largest uh, mobile network operator in Kenya, processes the equivalent of 50% of the Kenyan GDP. So the total amount of people transacting, the total volume of financial transactions people doing on their phones in Kenya now is half of the GDP. So that means almost everyone in a urban and a semi-urban environment has a phone and most likely has a mobile payment technology available to them. And that has a huge impact on the economy because the cost of cash is very high. Here in the US, everybody's used to pull out their credit card, make almost all small payments electronically, but in many developing countries, all payments are made in cash. And the cost of cash payments to the so the total economy is very high. Some people assume it's about 3% of GDP. So by cutting the cost of that by half, you would gain 1.5 percentage points of GDP, which is, of course, a very large amount of money. But it doesn't stop there. And that's where Kenya still is a very interesting example of, of what's happening in this space. Because once everybody transacts electronically, you get data. And you're getting into big data plays. Because now if you want to understand people's payment behavior, for example, to assess loans, to assess credit, you have this data available, which previously was completely unavailable. There's probably, I think there are credit bureaus in Kenya, but they have data on maybe 5% of the population. So banks, which reach 20% of the population maybe in Kenya, would only be able to make affordable loans to a very, very small part of the population. Now there are various providers in Kenya that are using the data generated from M-Pesa and now other mobile payment providers in the country to make very quick loan appraisals. So they can provide microloans or other financial products at very, very low cost. And in many cases these products are offered, marketed, promoted and so on through the mobile phones. So you're cutting what has probably been the biggest hindrance for the bank to service that part of the population cost out of, the, out of the equation, and you're making it possible for banks, but also microfinance institutions and others to service these people. And we are now seeing 
something like this replicated in other parts of the world. When M-Pesa started, there was much debate in, in, the, in the development community to what degree this could be replicated. Because in Kenya, you had one dominant network operator who had 75% of the mobile phone market. So people said, well, if they can do it, it doesn't necessarily mean it can happen elsewhere. But now you see many, many countries where something similar is happening in the Philippines, for example, or in Bangladesh. We've recently invested in, in, a, uh, in a service called Bcash in Bangladesh that is a mobile payment service for uh, Bangladeshis run by a microfinance bank. And we first looked at it, it was very small. It had, I think, about a million subscribers. So we thought, well, maybe this is very early for us to invest. We generally tend to make larger investments and not too early in the company's lifespan. And we took a few months to look at it, and then the company came back to us and said, well, now we have five million subscribers. So they <laughs> went from one million to five million subscribers within a few months. So we decided, well, we better make our investment in this now, because otherwise it will be so large that we probably can't make it, or then we won't need an investment anymore. So we made an investment now, Bcash has tens of millions of subscribers in Bangladesh, becoming a very dominant player. And you see a very similar dynamic happening to what you've seen in, in Kenya, where you see other providers, private sector providers, who latch on to the mobile payment program and provide other services, whether they are related to financial services, to mobile telephony, to content. You have had some education providers who are using it. The data is used for utility payments. In many cases, it's very difficult for utility companies to provide electricity, for example, in even semi-urban areas, because there's no means of collecting the payments. People have to go make a payment in cash. The cost is very high. So ultimately, in many cases, even if the service gets installed at some stage, it becomes dormant because the payments can't be collected because you can't debit people, you can't have a regular payment scheme. Where you have mobile payments for a larger part of the population, you can change this and you can, you can do this electronically. And that's what you're seeing now in Kenya and that's what you're seeing in some other countries where people subscribe to electricity and they can make their payments electronically. So they don't have to travel to the next town, find an office of the electricity company and pay for their electricity. They can do it from their mobile phone, which means if they run out of electricity on a Friday um, because they didn't have enough money to pay for it, um, they will be able to get the electricity switched on maybe on Saturday instead of having to wait until Monday when the electricity company opens their office again in the next city. So we believe that starting from, from payments, you begin to enable the whole financial sector to penetrate much, much deeper in the poorer part of the population. Because A, it becomes more affordable. B, you get the data that you need to provide many of the services. And ultimately, you get a very large macroeconomic effect, not only because you're saving money on not having to handle cash, but you also create uh, employment opportunities by providing microfinance, we're creating innovation, a lot of innovation you, you see in Kenya, many, many new companies who are using M-Pesa. Um, and the, the overall impact, I think, in Kenya has been, has been tremendous for the banks, for the utility companies, for, for health services, for education services, and so on. So it is a very, very important part, and it's a huge part of, I think, what will drive innovation for this segment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, you can't really run uh, computers, tablets, or charge them, uh, or, and telf telephones if you don't have power. And uh, if you don't have power that's uh, generated in a way that uh, protects communities, you'll also alienate uh, communities. And uh, the, our next speaker has thought a lot about these issues. Uh, Jacob Williams is Vice President of Global Energy Analytics at Peabody Energy. Um, and uh, Jacob, I'll turn it over to you to tell us a little bit about what's on your mind. All right. Thank you very much. And it's an honor to be here to, to be able to, to uh, address the, energy, uh, the, uh, the poverty issues, especially in the ASEAN area in Indonesia. And it's true that you cannot address poverty without providing energy. Energy is fundamental to our lives, and um, it is fundamental to, to the development. And fortunately for Indonesia and the ASEAN area, they have a tremendous amount of energy available to them that can be used, that is low cost, and it can be done so in a clean way to lift the people out of poverty uh, through all the devices we've talked about. But fundamentally, in every comment you heard, the power wasn't stable enough 
or we'd use a server somewhere else, or until we get power. It all came back to energy somewhere behind the scenes that was needed. And so um, if the way we view the world is there's about 3.8 billion people in the world who do not have adequate access to electricity. About 1.2 billion have no access to electricity. That's true poverty. Without electricity, you can't have clean water. You can't have uh, basic sanitation. You can't take it up a level and have refrigeration to store food for any length of time. You're always in the hunter-gatherer mode until you get some very basic things, lighting, even basic education. You can't use the internet without some form of energy uh, to do that. And so that um, one of the things that we believe is that you can actually, uh, as you improve um, the energy access, you improve quality of life. And the UN has put out their study of that and it's on the, the left there, and it shows you as the quality of life improves in their human development index, the amount of electricity that a country uses grows dramatically. And, and you see that where the countries like a, a Myanmar and some of those that are on the very early stage use almost no electricity, the quality of life is difficult. And then as you move up and around the curve, it's staggering how much more energy you use. And that's because electricity and energy allow you to access and, and improve the quality of life. The other thing that comes with that is your life expectancy, if you look across the world, as you uh, increase life expectancy, you use 10 times as much electricity for every 10 years life expectancy increase because it's the electricity and the energy that allow you the quality of life to expand and all that. Things like MRIs and all that that we take for granted today, they're all energy hogs that, that we need that, that are helpful for quality of life that we just take for granted here. But there are very basic things that in a small scale you can do in, in small countries to start out. And then the tie-in. The largest source of electricity in the world is coal. Coal is the largest, it will be the largest source of energy in the world in the next three years. Little known to most people. And why is that? It's because people around the world want affordable electricity. That is why. And, and, and so that's what's driving it. In countries like China and India that have went through or are going through this same, uh, bringing their people out of poverty, it's the same thing that you see in the ASEAN area uh, as well that can happen. And, and so that, that will continue. The ASEAN area has quite a bit of, uh, of, of uh, generation growth that's going to occur. I won't go into that in detail. Um, but it, it's not surprising that the growth in, in electricity supplies in the ASEAN area will be on because of coal, because of the resource that Indonesia has uh, that can supply the entire region, not only itself. Indonesia, many of you don't realize, is the largest exporter of coal to the rest of the world. Uh, it surpassed Australia over the last 10 years, and now it is the largest exporter to, it, to the ASEAN area as well as to China and India that helps lift those, their, uh, their, them out of uh, poverty as well. And so when you deal, and why is that? Why did, why is everyone turned to coal? This is a chart, just real simple. Puts the, the value of oil, natural gas, and coal on a dollar per million BTU. Coal is the cheapest form of energy in which to power electricity. That is why you turn to coal. Very simple. Um, and, and that is why, and the Indonesia coal is the lowest cost coal. So again, it is the, the bedrock. And, and as you see, um, the areas, uh, Indonesia exports over, um, essentially is about a third of the amount of coal we use in the United States, Indonesia exports each year to the rest of the region. And then we want to deal with, but everyone says, but coal, it's, it, there's emissions, there's problems and all that. And we go, yes, there used to be, and yes, there is technology that's available today that can solve that immediately. You don't have to wait 20 to 40 years. Picture on the, the two pictures there are Pittsburgh in the 1950s and Pittsburgh today. The area around Pittsburgh uses tremendously more coal than it did in the 50s, and yet today it is very clean and very, very high quality of life. That technology that allowed the United States to, to increase its amount of electricity by two and a half times from, from coal, and yet the emissions was reduced by 90% all at the same time. That technology is now developed and you can now put that on plants as you supply energy to um, communities throughout. And so as a result, the ASEAN area can take the technology not of the 70s, but of today that's, that's very low emission rates and apply it to right away. 
and so that you don't have the environmental concerns at all, and you can have affordable electricity to lift people out of poverty, provide electricity, lighting, internet access, all those things, and do so in a very clean way all at the same time. And that's where energy comes into helping reduce poverty. And so with that, I think I'll stop right there. Well, I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in thanking our speakers for their comments. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, let me ask uh, the ambassador if he uh, has any questions to kick off uh, before I open it up to the, sure. uh, to the audience. Uh, one quick question to, to uh, uh, Jacob. Um, I mentioned this technology to some of my friends who own uh, coal uh, factories, and they say uh, it's a bit expensive and, and hard to get. Uh, what would be the answer to that? Um, it may cost an extra 25% mm -hmm. from your base power plant technology. Mm -hmm. The United States, every plant has it now. Mm -hmm. So it can be done, mm -hmm. and as governments can start to say, we want affordable electricity, but we'll pay a little bit more to get the control technology. It's available. The, the, um, it's used around the world in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, even China. Their new plants are very clean. It's a problem as the old plants. But you can put new plants in and put the technology on. It's available off the street today. OK. Uh, let me open the floor to uh, questions, observations, and also the panel is welcome to uh, ask questions of the other panelists. Uh, Madam. Could you bring a microphone around to the yeah, uh, I have a, well, it's not really a question for Mr. Williams, but uh, coal is almost pure carbon. It burns to carbon dioxide to produce the energy that produces global warming, that causes the rise in the sea level, that will flood many Indonesian islands as time goes on. I think the increasing use of coal is very frightening and uh, I would hope even though of course the uh, solar panels and wind energy and so forth are much more expensive still, I think it's much more important to put the investment into non-carbon producers of energy and what is your company doing in that regard? Before you. Uh before you answer, would you mind uh, stating who you are? I should have mentioned that we're, uh, we're actually using technology here, and the program is live on the internet, and it's being webcast live. So uh, for everybody who's watching, would you please state your name and your organization? When you okay, have I'm, I'm Helen Rafael. I worked in Indonesia for two years, a long time ago, teaching <laughs> chemistry. And uh, uh, I'm now an environmentalist with resources for the future. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Jacob. I always love to address those issues. Um, first of all, there are, there are an array of problems countries in the world face. If you put um, the concerns, the model concerns of climate change, there's very draconian things in the future. The problem is the data, the actual changes that we have now experienced since the 90s and the 80s that this is a model. The slope of the curve is about like that, not like that. So, but there are problems real world today that affect lives, people die because they do not have clean water today. Not a model problem in the future, it is today's problem. They die because they do not have sanitation. They die because they do not have proper refrigeration for food. Those problems require energy now, not, we'll wait until three decades from now and we'll get you that. I would rather solve those problems today and let technology keep working on the others. That's where we start from. We'd rather lift up as many people as we can out of poverty today. We can solve the other problems forward and the models are overestimating what has actually occurred. Anybody else want to comment on this? It's, it, sound, it seems to me like we should probably address this issue now while, while it's on the table. Anyone? No? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, I thought you might swing at yeah. that. I was wondering. Um, obviously, this is the subject of heated debate. Um, but the risks of being wrong are enormous with respect to climate change. And once we make the investment in any resource, 
we have committed ourselves to that investment and we will live with it for decades. So I think there's a strong case to be made and I don't presume to say what the right answer is. You could probably guess what I think, but what matters is the discussion of uh, perhaps being willing to invest a little bit more now to have the best of both worlds 20 years from now and to have the world, in fact, 20 or 30 years from now. Good. Uh, the gentleman in the, in the back. Sorry, I missed you. Oh, thank you. Um, Dan Kingsley from USAID, uh, Global uh, Broadband Innovations Program. Um, first of all, uh, Baba Ambassador, uh, Washington's loss is Indonesia's gain. Um, I was glad to hear uh, why you're going back. I'll have to email our mutual friend Andy and find out why he didn't tell me first. But um, we, we've been involved for 15 months in Indonesia. And we have reached a point now, Lou, uh, where Microsoft, USAID, Cominfo, Bapanas, and some local uh, mobile network operators are, have the exemptions necessary and are uh, in the process of putting together a TV white space project. Building on what Lou said, TV white space is a technology that can reach the urban poor, which is the mission of my program, our program at USAID, for about $2 per month per prescriber. If, you know, everything comes together, and I've just mentioned a few of the components. Um, for the donors out there, for the private sector, I would like to tell you that for the last 15 months, we've had full cooperation from Bapanas, Kaminvo, Muntri Kawangan, in, um, in getting the machete or the, con let's say, the conflicting laws in place so that the market is becoming more competitive, so that prices for broadband can come down for the rural poor and all of those things that the panelists have mentioned that technology can bring to poor pro, pro, pro growth are in a process and I, I'm very proud to see what's been accomplished in Indonesia over the last two years and hopefully next August when I'm there it will be Bapak uh, de pe de. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Uh, gen gentlemen, would you like to uh, respond to that? Well, I'm, ex I'm excited to hear about your progress. And I, I worked a bit with NetHope when they worked on that initiative with you guys. So very much appreciated by the, by the entire sector. You know, I think this, the whole thing, as we're tackling the, the connectivity and the the, the broadband issue is, is the content issue. I'm surprised when I go country to country, the challenges I still have sourcing relevant content that aligns with the ministry's syllabus, especially when I'm dealing with local languages. And uh, you know, if there's something that we all together can do in that space, maybe making more of an open source, making, maybe make, creating a better indexing system, way of accessing you know, high quality content, uh, I think that's another big challenge on our horizon. Thanks. I, I wanted to ask a follow-up question for, for the panelists, uh, and maybe uh, you'd have a comment, sir. Uh, the, you know, the Indonesian um, mobile phone market is actually very well penetrated. I mean, uh, there's a, the, some could argue that there's too much competition there to the, to the point where um, you know, new t it's expensive. The, 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 phones, the phone companies aren't really introducing a lot of new technologies or the, the service and the bandwidth is being so used up by these companies that a lot of users complain about uh, the service that they get from their current, uh, their current users. So anybody who does business in Indonesia, and I see some Indonesian heads nodding, you know, you, it's amazing because these are some of the world's best um, uh, or the most advanced technologies being deployed in Indonesia, but um, because of bandwidth issues and uh, frequency allocation, 
um, and other reasons, um, you find out that you know, calls drop you know, in, in Indonesia, which is strange, particularly in a country where you know, I think Indonesians are the fastest adapters of new telecom technology of any, almost any country in the world. So, I mean, try to get an iPhone 5S in Indonesia and, and not you know, have to fight through a scrum to get it. You know, you've really got to be good. Anyone want to comment on, on, on that issue? Because you know, I think Dino would face that issue as he uh, goes back. Okay. Uh, I, I, I really so. Um, I think that is actually an issue that you see in many markets uh, where mobile telephony itself is no longer a big revenue driver for the network operators and the margins are being squeezed even in markets that are not as competitive as Indonesia. Um, so many of the mobile network operators are now looking at other services that they can sell through their networks and to their subscriber base. Um, data, of course, is the next, uh, the next frontier, if you like, so everybody wants to have mobile commerce because, I guess, um, mobile commerce and, and entertainment are probably the, the, the two biggest drivers for the usage of, of bandwidth that you will see. Um, however, if you're not generating sufficient revenues, it's difficult to invest in these new areas. Um, so it, it, it does create bottlenecks, but it also opens opportunities for for other companies to sell services to the mobile network operators that will help them to increase revenues from their base. And not to drill on M-Pesa, but that was the main reason why Safaricom suffered through three years of losses um, uh, with this service, because they knew they needed another revenue driver rather than just voice, which wasn't sufficient anymore, and they had more and more competition from two other companies who had obtained licenses. And I think mobile commerce may ultimately be, I think, in terms of, in terms of that segment of technology, um, a key determinant how quickly you make uh, use of, of the connectivity, because Mobile commerce, of course, increases the availability of goods, reduces prices for consumers, and has many, many benefits. But where you don't have sufficient bandwidth, or you don't have, uh, you don't have uh, that data bandwidth and, and affordable phones where people can use it, 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 it really creates a, a uh, creates a large uh, problem. And the the biggest bottleneck, other than the data, which in, in I would say in many what we call tier two countries like Brazil and so on, uh, countries is now available. You have sufficient data. If you're looking at e-commerce going forward, one of the biggest bottlenecks you hit then is again payments, because many of the people who are now able to use mobile data are not able to make payments electronically. So if they were wanted to buy content or whether they wanted to transact electronically, buy things in e-commerce, they are unable to do so because they have no means of electronic payments. So I think it's another example where both the payment technology enables the network operator to invest in expanding the bandwidth uh, or the, the data, the availability of, of data connectivity, and at the same time that really having a very large uh, impact on, on macroeconomic development. Thank you. Uh, did you want to add anything to the Sayer? You wanted to respond to uh, In the United States, we have special interests. We have issues with regulatory. Um, uh, certainty and in, in all countries you do so by no means is Indonesia exempt from that. And so it's a very, very slow process, you know, bringing connectivity data to deliver data, you know, is there, there are those companies that have paid for frequency. And they have this investment, and, and now we're moving to the new technologies, the low-cost technologies. Uh, widen, you know, as we go from analog broadcast to digital broadcast, we have a huge amount of space for, for delivering um, low-cost connectivity. But there, it's a slow process because there are conflicting interests. Not only within Indonesia, but internationally. Thank you. Uh, Warren West with Research Triangle Institute. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, it's exciting to hear many of the uh, innovations that external groups, private sector, are partnering with Indonesian institutes and the cooperation from the government itself. 
How do you, in your return, see yourself helping to address increasing Indonesia's own intellectual capacity, building its research and innovation itself so that the intellectual capital in Indonesia can take on this leadership role within your own country? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are actually one of the countries that spend the least on R&D. Uh, I don't have the precise uh, percentage, uh, but uh, both for government and private sector, we spend the least uh, on R&D. And if you look at the number of patents that Indonesians uh, register, we are also among uh, the lowest. So um, there are two kinds of uh, Technology users. Uh, the one is uh, the technology inventors, and the one is the other one is the technology emulators. Uh, I think Indonesia's next ambition would be not to invent technologies, but to emulate. Yeah, uh, just to find out what's out there and adapt them to our purpose. I mean, if you ask me what my plan is, uh, if if I was to be president, 2014, I would. Uh, transform the current Ministry of Research and Technology to uh, research technology and innovation, right? Well, and secondly, I would start to build an ecosystem for uh, innovation. Uh, in Indonesia, we have a lot of smart universities, a lot of very smart IT, uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, IT genius. I was surprised to learn the other day that uh, uh, Indonesia now has surpassed China as the number one source of cyber attack. Uh, I don't know, that's not mm. entirely good news, <laughs> but at least at least it does show that we have a lot of talented hackers that can be used for, for, for a good purpose, right? Uh, but uh, I think establishing a good ecosystem between government, uh, private sector, universities, and, and the technology community, the civil society, would be job number one if we are going to be heading towards uh, innovation uh, economy. Thank you. Um, Oliver Bell, I'm Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft's um, Development and uh, Humanitarian Organizations team. I, I think there's probably two areas where I'd like to hear some more, some more thoughts from, um, from, from the folks on the panel. Uh, and going back to your opening comments, Mr. Ambassador, around sort of where is technology going to make a fundamental difference to the way we think about some of these challenges. Uh, the, the first one is really about financing and the development process itself. So I think there's a lot of smart people in this town and, and many of the towns like it in the world thinking about how we apply technology to development challenges. And we've heard many examples of innovations on those lines today. But I think there's a much bigger revolution that we're on the cusp of in some way. Um, if you think of the way that commercial financing's changed for businesses in the last 20 years. 20 years ago we would have gone to a bank to finance a new business. 10 years ago we would have gone to a, a venture capitalist. Today we'd probably go to a Kickstarter type site and do a crowdfunding sort of approach to, to finding the money we want. I think we're probably not far away from a village being able to identify its own development challenges and crowdsourcing both funding and expertise and other things it needs to, to really make that happen. So I'd love to get the, the panel's thoughts on what other innovations are we on the cusp of like that that are really going to change the way that, that we really think about, about development as a whole. My second sort of area of interest, I guess, is around, is around youth in that community and what difference that makes. So I'm, I'm somewhere around about 40 years old. Um, I, I was introduced to technology in my early teens, and it's been a large part of my life ever since then. But I was introduced to it as part of my, my sort of upbringing. Right behind us is a generation of people who, where it's been endemic to everything they've always done. So it's not about how do I apply technology to solving a problem, it's technology has always been a core part of their lives. So as those people begin to enter politics and become politically aware, we're going to see a very different level of thought, a very different set of thought processes around policy making and the impact of technology on policies that are yet to come. Um, I, I did a little bit of a project about two years ago to look for IT ministers who were under 40 years old. Uh, and Ivo Ivanovic, who's the IT minister of Macedonia, was the only one I found at the time. There may be more now, but it's a very limited group of people. I think we're, we're kind of, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious about what happens to policy making, what happens to the development challenges in IT when that generation becomes politically aware and part of the, the policy leadership. And how do we nurture that and encourage that to happen a little bit more quickly? So, two questions. One is, what, what impact does technology really have on development itself? Second one is on how do we do more with the youth community to really use that expertise to make these changes happen a little bit more quickly. 
Great question, and uh, maybe I'll mention our friends at USAID again. Uh, I think USAID's recognized the need for different approaches to development as well. And uh, a few years back, they introduced the grand challenges. That's an idea where government aid agencies just don't hand money out for development projects. Rather, they look for the partners who, have, who are like-minded, similar goals, and get them together and, and share their resources. World Vision's a partner with USAID and AUSAID and the U.S. Department of Education in the Education Grand Challenge, where we are funding uh, about uh, $17 million in uh, solutions really focusing on, on technology now in the developing world. So I think it's, it's finding your partners who are like-minded, who have similar ambitions. Uh, with Microsoft, World Vision is partnered in Africa and uh, exact same model. World Vision's providing financial resources. You're actually providing technology and software resources. British Council's providing training resources and Intel's providing hardware resources. And we're all like-minded and we're all able to multiply off of each other's efforts. I think that uh, governments, and I'm not sure if, if Indonesia has a universal access fund, but I think if, if it doesn't, it, it probably ought to get one. It's where you can start subsidizing the people who are more uh, difficult to connect. Uh, also the development banks, of course, uh, really countries sort of banking on, well, what's the improvement of our economy going to look like after making an investment? And, and maybe we should go ahead and make that investment and uh, reap those rewards later on. You combine that money with USA money, with with World Vision money or other NGO money, and you've really created a multiplier. Yeah, I, uh, a great question. And uh, one of the points of reference, you know, completely different worlds, non-technology versus technology, but similar models. So a point of reference with respect to how to finance. You know, 10 years ago it was bang, or 20 years. 10 years ago, venture capitalist, today someone in prison, whatever. Um, but uh, probably the venture capitalist. Uh, ouch. <laughs> but information sharing uh, was extraordinarily successful in the rural areas of the developing world through farmer to farmer visits. People learn and adopt extraordinarily well from their peers because they understand the problems and they understand the language. So when we come back to social media, I think one of the greatest strengths of social media is it will exchange information on and create new ideas and new ways to do things, things that didn't exist before because through that community, they discovered and created a need and a solution. And I think that's happening in many, many places. I was recently in Haiti, and Digicel is in Haiti, and they're doing mobile money, and they're investing in a big way all over the Caribbean. But they're not just giving people what they want, or what they want to give those people, but people are inventing things that they need that will solve their problems by talking to each other. So it's a very rich space. I would, I would just just quickly add, and then I'll go to the questioner here. Um, I, I think maybe what you were also referring to is with technology, you can collect taxes and track government spending much more efficiently. Um, if you do that, uh, the government has more money to spend, should have more money to spend on infrastructure and um, on people, on in education and health. And um, I think that's uh, that's somewhere you know where where you can have incredible impact at, at the governmental level and it frees up resources for the private sector. I, I know for a fact, you know, I've worked with Microsoft in, in Vietnam uh, on some of these issues through a World Bank grant um, with the Ministry of Finance and um, putting governments online also forces uh, government workers, which were in Vietnam until a couple of years ago, still the majority of uh, salaried employees. Uh, they, you have to have a bank account to get paid electronically, and the governments were forcing people to uh, take their paychecks through a transfer instead of a check. Um, and, and that was, that is, well, I should say that is transforming Vietnam. Uh, so I think um, that's another real way where you can. Exactly. Yeah. That, I mean, I think. Leadership like that, I mean, I, you know, I would just share with you that, that idea that um, 
you can you can find ways like that that actually influence society so that everybody you know if you're being paid electronically then you're going to willing to spend electronically uh, or by your phone and uh, it changes everything so i'm sorry your, your lady uh, in the third row i think had a question hi i'm meredith sandler uh thank you your excellency and others here this is really interesting um, and helpful my question is uh, has to do with the trans-pacific partnership um, and we've been talking about private sector involvement or nonprofit sector, but um, one of the things that the TPP uh, prides itself is, is that it's a 21st century agreement, and it includes ICT uh, and hopefully a thought about how technology can benefit the poor. Um, what do you think that is needed that's missing in terms of policy or you know knowing that technology is not uh, necessarily, you know, respective of, respects national borders, or international borders. Um, what can the TPP do, let's say, for those 12 countries that are, that are members of it? And flip side, how would that be perhaps detrimental for the countries that are not yet members, both on, in the Southeast Asia region as well as uh, Latin America? Thank you. Uh, in the U.S., the U.S. Governors Association put together a program that became the core standards, and uh, that became a program where every state now just about has similar uh, education requirements. What that does is it allows technology creators, the authors of the technology tools, to author something once, not for every single one of the 50 states and their nuances and their standards. Uh, we encounter that frequently in regions around the world, World Vision does, where countries, uh, you know, just for their own reasons of autonomy or whatever, might deviate, create an intentional difference uh, that really doesn't have to be there. But, when, but if it, and if it wasn't there, it would be a lot easier for the authors of educational content to, to create something once rather than multiple times for each country. So I think getting countries on similar standards where they can, yet at the same time respecting their differences, can do a lot towards catapulting the quality and even existence in some cases of, of learning content. I would just add intellectual property is, is a big issue. Um, you know, we, we've seen throughout Southeast Asia that countries that do exactly what the ambassador said, you know, they turn towards innovation and start, those innovators start to bring, if there's an environment where innovators can take technology to the market and be financed, uh, like Kai was talking about, they, they want their technology protected so that they can recoup their investment and, uh, and, and then invest more. And I think um, when that penny drops in economies, uh, econ there's a demand pull for uh, intellectual property uh, protections if it's properly done. And I think that's a challenge both for the TPP uh, to get that right. Uh, and I think it's a challenge for countries who are not in the TPP because once the TPP happens, there will be a dozen countries who have sort of agreed to the, to the format that Lou mentioned where, you know, it'll be one standard and they will take off in terms of innovation. Um, and I think um, that's, that's something that I think other countries will have to really consider because there, there will be start to be competitive, um, you know, tearing of bone and muscle uh, because um, th there'll be something going on in the, within those 12 economies which are 40% uh, of the world's GDP uh, collectively. Uh, question here. Hi, uh, Tim Xiao from USAID Office of Science Technology. So I have a question for Mr. Ambassador. So we've been hearing about a uh, different uh, way to apply technology to help the poor. And uh, but so far what I'm hearing about is mostly still more a top-down approach where we have a group of elite to identify the good technology and distribute to the, to the crowd. And echoing to what Asif just mentioned about, uh, very often it is those uh, uh, people who live in the villages who know about a problem 
who know the language, who lived there for years. So um, we're mentioning about this because I think recently uh, uh, U.S. has taken a new strategy direction where we believe that we are, we are not always the one to tell what the crowd should be and what it should receive. So instead of uh, always treating the population as a solution receiver, but actually educating them to become a problem solver. So um, one of the tools, as uh, Liu has mentioned about, is our Grand Challenge program. But also there are other type of prizes program where we basically just define, we try to talk to people who live in a certain village, who actually work on the ground for a long time, and ask them, okay, what's the uh, most important bottleneck in this development field? And then we throw out an open call. Whoever had, who had any kind of solution to tackle this issue, we're welcome to hear from you. And by doing this, they actually have a lot of a proposal submission uh, given to us, and we hear about a lot of ideas that we never thought about that could be a solution. So I wonder whether, because uh, um, Mr. Mesa, you mentioned about, apart from science, technology, you also mentioned about the innovation part. I wonder if you have a strategy for citizen innovation and also citizen science in your, in your overall strategy for, for the, your campaign. Thank you. Feels like the presidential debate already. Yeah. <laughs> Get used to it. <laughs> look, uh, look well, I, I think one, thing, one, one of the most uh, important area of pro poor technology will be in uh, food and um, agriculture uh, production. Uh, because uh, obviously in Indonesia, um, from, from my experience, 1% uh, growth. Uh, of the economy uh, leads to a 1.3 percent reduction of poverty in Indonesia, and and this is why in Indonesia there was a time when we lifted uh, so many millions of people uh, out of uh, uh, out of out of poverty, um, and one of the key ways by which we uh, lifted millions out of poverty was uh, by way of uh, uh, increasing rural productivity. Right. Uh, in, in Indonesia, our problem is that now land is limited. I know we have a lot of land, but the land that can be used for uh, agricultural uh, productivity is, is quite limited. If I'm not mistaken, it's about around 50 million uh, hectares. Uh, and within that, uh, we are seeing not much rise in uh, uh, productivity. Uh, if you look at the uh, productivity of rice in soybean and, and, and palm oil, uh, the productivity of rice is quite uh, limited. Right? Um, and our problem also is compounded by the fact that uh, land ownership uh, per farmer is very low. Uh, it's uh, less than one hectare. Right? Uh, and if you want to raise the uh, standard of living, uh, we need more, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, agglomeration, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, so so that's, that's where we are now. I, th I think the key lies in finding uh, new technology that will allow us to decrease the uh, number of people working in the agricultural sector, but rise, uh, increase their uh, productivity. Uh, it does require investment. Uh, the reason why Brazil was very uh, successful in becoming a food superpower was uh, they created uh, Embrapa, you know, uh, and they spent billions of dollars every year um, uh, to finance uh, research and development so that Brazil's uh, food crops can grow in areas that were not able to grow uh, before. Uh, so the key, uh, you know, my wife says, Adarupa uh, Adaharga, you know, if you want to have quality, you got to pay for it. Uh, and in Indonesia, it's time, if we want to have the right uh, production rise, uh, is to uh, invest uh, in, in uh, the research and development in, in these areas. But food production and agriculture would be my number one answer. Let me get a small comment. Yeah, please. Uh, I've seen a bit in, in East Africa, the crowdsourcing of agricultural extension services mm -hmm. that, that you might consider where community internet centers are used as agricultural extension services and university students who are trained in agriculture uh, work in those centers receiving in some cases SMS and messages 
through a, a, a frontline SMS-based system. It's just anybody who has an SMS-capable phone can get agricultural support services, uh, as well as, of course, more sophisticated devices. So something you might want to consider. Yeah, I, I would just add quickly, and then I'll go to, uh, to the question. But I think um, the good news also is that uh, companies, I think, are looking for a greater role in development, and they, they're also looking for better alignment in uh, countries like Indonesia. So they want to know what people at the community level are thinking. There's a gap here, though. Be, you know, how do they find out? You know, and, and you don't want to go to a village and say, hey, I'm you know, XYZ company. Tell me what you, know, what you want, because then you know, things might get out of hand. You know, they, people might want a lot. Uh, but I think companies want to know how to better align with communities, with local government leadership. And, um, this is, I think there's a real paradigm shift in de development underway here. Uh, and it's, it's something we're working on at CSIS. Uh, there aren't you know, simple answers to this, but I think uh, you know, Indonesia would be a great place because you could, there is a lot of, if, if you spend any time in Indonesia, the thing that pops out is, wow, people here are really with it. You know, they really are thinking and trying to solve problems. And if you could tap into that as a company, um, you, you can help get yourself on the same side of the table as regulators and, and policy makers instead of being sort of coming in and say, look, I want to I wanna put my business model in Indonesia and I, damn it, why doesn't it work? You know, I think there's a lot of companies that are really frustrated right now with that. But the, it, the, it's a slight shift and the slight shift is, you know, how do Indonesians, what are their issues, what are their problems, how do you get on the same side of the table and then things will start to pop, I think, on the development side yeah, with private sector involvement. Um, right here, Lex, in the front. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lex Riefel with the Brookings Institution. For the panel, uh, when many of us think of the poor in Indonesia, I think we, we think first of the rural poor, but uh, I imagine that uh, in the decades to come, uh, the poor are going to be more and more urban based and I'm wondering sort of how the technology uh, factor uh, is going to work. Uh, is that going to help uh, address uh, poor uh, poverty in urban areas or is it, uh, I mean, how can it help? Well the, the, the urban or part of it is, it, again, you go back to bringing things that are, become very affordable, as low cost as you can to provide high quality service. It's energy, that's part of it. If you, but if you say we're going to run to the highest cost resources, then you keep energy completely unaffordable to those in the urban areas, and that can't happen. It has to be affordable to all. There are micro, you know, villages and things as they first get, they use solar cells and things like that. That's great in micro, but once you start to get communities of scale, you have to have scale facilities to do that. And that's, that's one of those things that's just it's fundamental. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, great question and, and uh, something I'm very passionate about because I think technology provides a unique solution. Uh, I was recently in Kenya and uh, there is a very large slum in Nairobi. Uh, the Kibera slums, and I happened to also have been in uh, Kisumu talking to a Luo tribe, and I asked the Luo, we interviewed a number of them, and I said, how many of you would like to move to Nairobi? Uh, we probably talked to close to a hundred people in this Luo tribe outside of Lake Victoria. Do you know how many of them wanted to move to Nairobi? Zero. Zero. Mm -hmm. None. The only reason that people are going to cities is to avoid starvation. And so if we could bring jobs to people rather than people to jobs, we've solved the problem. And in fact, we have made a better solution than what was there in the beginning because it's a lot easier to support a human being in the village that they were born in who don't have to commute to work, who don't have to build houses on expensive land, who don't have to build complex infrastructure to keep people alive. If you can keep people where they're from, you have the massive cost advantage versus a, an employer or a city who has to pay a higher wage because of competition. And we're starting to see that now, and I really hope that you from the private sector support the movement of impact sourcing. It's the idea of taking micro work, small work, 
and pushing it out to pl the places where people are from so they don't have to leave their families and their, their millions of years of heritage and get decimated culturally like what's happened in this country and so many other parts of the world. And so uh, look into impact sourcing. Uh, one uh, uh, Lex, uh, you, you, you put it right on the money because uh, now more than 50% of Indonesians uh, are living in urban areas and we are heading to a situation whereby within our generation about 70% of Indonesians will live in urban areas and they will consume about 80% of the GDP, right? So urban development is, is going to be the key. But one interesting uh, technology that we're putting into practice, at least in Jakarta, is what is called the uh, vertical uh, green village, right? Uh, I had no idea what it was until I, you know, I learned about it. But um, they, they, it's one of our diaspora in Holland, and they, they f are trying to resolve the problem of slums, a lot of villages in the outskirts of Jakarta. Uh, and they came up with a design that built uh, the villages upward instead of uh, spreading, uh, you know, uh, horizontally, uh, and designed in such a way that uh, they are very uh, environmental friendly, very green. green. Uh, doesn't uh, uh, cause pollution uh, and very well designed and quite modern, right? Um, so it's just very much in the early phase, but I think if this concept of horizontal um, green villages can, can take off, I think it will change the face of uh, urban, uh, you know, urban population, uh, including its impact on urban poverty in Indonesia. Hi, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, maybe present a slightly a different view to what, what Lou was saying. I think there are different dynamics when you look at urbanization. You have, of course, very poor people who are desperate and hence end up in the big cities and in a slum, but I think there's also a very large part of the population that doesn't leave their more rural setting out of desperation, but basically in search of better opportunities. And I think urbanization, in many, in my opinion, presents more solution than it actually is a problem. Because once you concentrate people, you solve many problems. You solve the availability of electricity, you solve the availability of, of uh, data access and many other issues. And I think technology will play an even larger part there than you would have in rural areas because you will get into the concept of smart cities. And if you look at some of the developments that have taken place, especially in developing countries, where cities are built from scratch and there's an ability to build them much smarter than the cities that we, I'm from Europe, so our cities tend to be hundreds of years old and the roads don't work and everything is built in a way that you wouldn't do it anymore. And you see how much better these modern cities work where you have applied technology in a very intelligent way and you solve problems with sanitation, electricity and so on. I, I think um, it's probably uh, urbanization and technology are two things that are working together to make people's lives better rather than the opposite. Sounds like we could have a good debate here. Uh, Lynn? Thank you. Um, Lynn Kwok, Harvard Kennedy School. Um, Lex just mentioned um, dividing the poor up into the urban poor and rural poor to look at um, solutions for both. But another way of looking at it as well is um, the poor in conflict zones and non-conflict zones. And um, I was wondering whether you had any thoughts in terms of how to use technology to solve the problem of poverty in conflict zones. I could jump on that one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, something I was working on just today, actually. I think. Good question. Uh, some, a lot of the, the, the solution I was mentioning to you is something that we're looking closely into, this idea of creating a, uh, a, a Wi-Fi, a, a, a curriculum that can be delivered off of a small, low-cost, highly portable device, pushed out to uh, very inexpensive, highly portable devices in a very rich format with a learning management system, an LMS, that will keep track of what materials are people studying, how far along are they, and then being able to provide results back. Everybody knows it's better to have a teacher in a classroom, but it's, sometimes it's best for students not to go and convene in an area you know, all together. You've heard of shelter in place. There's also learn in place during areas of, in situations of high conflict. If you can enable a learn in place environment, uh, then, then you've solved a lot of the problem. And so some of these technologies and learning are, are really exciting for the, for the emergency uh, environment. 
uh, again, the ability to store vast amounts of content, push it on local wireless systems, low-cost devices that can deliver rich content and provide a learning management system so you can track results. He's thought about that. Uh, there was, uh, here. And then. Uh, my name uh, is Zubhanshu. I'm from India. Uh, just uh, any of the panelists could answer this. Could you throw some light on connecting uh, the three, 3D printing technology uh, with the telemedicine to provide cheaper health services to the remote areas of like any developing country like Indonesia, for example? Thank you. Okay. Before you answer that, let's. I want to take the woman's question in the back, and then that will be the last question, and we'll ask the panel to answer both. Salamat Sari. My name is Ina Dubinsky, and I am with the International Broadcasting Bureau. I just was in Indonesia last spring, and in many conversations with my fellow journalists, uh, actually they confirmed a well-known uh, thing, that one of the major gaps between the poor and the affluent is access to education and to information. And that's what we are working on with our Indonesian partners. You probably know that Voice of America has more than 440 uh, affiliates in Indonesia. So we expand their access to, inf uh, to information to multiple platforms uh, to deliver news and information to local audiences. And we see huge impact. So uh, that's uh, the venue we are pursuing and uh, we'll welcome your input. And actually, we are planning another tour to train journalists uh, in February. So you're very welcome to attend our seminars and to speak to uh, Indonesian journalists. Good. Thank you. OK, panel, uh, 3D uh, printing and its impact on uh, rural health and then uh, edu uh, access to education uh, through through the media. Um, just a brief word. I, I spent some time the other evening talking about 3D printing and have spent a lot of time studying it. Uh, <clears throat> I think for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, you should know that major experts and scientists are saying it will have a greater impact than the Industrial Revolution and than the Digital Revolution. So we're not talking about a quack notion. Okay. And what basically it will, uh, and the things it can do, you know, it can print hips and uh, machines and rockets and all of these other things. The key is, of course, the scanning and the program that tells the printer what to do and getting the materials to do it. But you can buy one now for under $1,000. It can print human livers. My reaction to that was, I'll drink to that, but, uh, <laughs> but I don't understand it. It is going to be transformational. So what's it going to do? It's going to allow dispersed production, and that necessarily has an impact in rural areas. It's relatively simple, it's accessible, it exists, and for emergency situations, uh, for medical and health care, it may allow providing things there then right away that w would simply have had to come by bicycle or cart or truck or whatever else from hundreds of miles away. But its impact is not just going to be in health. It's going to be in understanding and creating that same process we were talking about before where people uh, develop things and uh, they can make them. So I, I think 3D printing is very exciting. I'll stop there. I, I would just say I was at a, um, this elite seminar for the top 100 supply chain managers in the world. And they had a two hour d deep dive on, supply, on uh, 3D printing. And I learned a lot uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, it's actually been around for a long time. And, and I would agree with everything you said. Um, there are real issues, though. There are real limitations, and they tend to be sort of regulatory and how you manage uh, the rules around it, because it can do 
incredible things, but that's also a problem. Um, so uh, th this area, if you're into, you know, cutting edge policy, um, dig into, the, open a book on 3D printing, it's, it's going to be very fascinating. But they all agreed that it would transform their businesses completely. Um, did anyone want to address the, uh, the ladies? Sure. Thank you, Dean. Good. And I will come to your, your seminar. Just send me an invitation. Uh, I think the biggest challenge we have in Indonesia in terms of education is uh, inequality. Yeah. Um, access to uh, uh, quality uh, education. Uh, to give you an example, the top quintile of Indonesian uh, richest uh, uh, families, 60% of their kids go to universities. The lowest one, 1%. Right? So you can see uh, the huge uh, difference. Uh, once you go to a different economic class in terms of access uh, to, to education. So, so it's a big challenge uh, for us. Uh, and I think one of the key challenges in terms of uh, educating Indonesians today, one is how to uh, inject more scientific and digital literacy into the curriculum. So that's one challenge. And it's not there yet. Yeah? And secondly, how to educate our kids to 21st century 21st century skills, you know, uh, and again, it's not there yet. Uh, I, MVC had a program once uh, to try to mobilize the diaspora to provide computers for Indonesian schools. And we have one of the largest educational system in Asia. Uh, we have about 50 million students uh, in, Indonesia, in, in Indonesia. You know, that's, that's a huge uh, uh, system. Um, and a lot of our schools, especially in the rural rural area and, and remote areas don't have uh, enough computers. Some don't even have electricity. Right? So I think the job of the next president of Indonesia is to ensure that every school is, has not just one computer, but a set of computers. And it's not so expensive if you count the budget. But what is more important is not just making sure that they have computers and the kids know how to type and use the computer, but how to use the computers as educational tools. Right? And this is where one area that I think we can work on uh, a lot more, you know, using computers to teach the students something rather than the kids just knowing how to type on a computer. Because in most schools, that's what, what, what I see happening. Maybe I can come in. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers and thank you for coming. I'd like to thank uh, the ambassador. Uh, he's obviously got a very bright future. Um, I think uh, he owes great uh, thanks to his wife, uh, Rosa, who is, uh, I, I like the comment on quality. I, I'm sure, uh, I think we've all heard a version of that. Um, but you are a lucky man, uh, Dino. Uh, you've got great people uh, supporting you. Uh, I think we will really miss you here in Washington. And when you come back uh, in whatever, uh, whatever hat you're wearing, uh, uh, we hope you'll come to CSIS and, and spend some time with us, and we hope to see you in Jakarta. So thank you all for joining. Can, can, can I just... Can, can I time ago when uh, I was here in year 2000, uh, he was a lot skinnier back then. Uh, now, uh, you know, he's more, uh, you know, what do you call it, more, thick. more thick and uh, a lot more uh, zeros to his bank account because uh, he's a successful uh, consultant. Uh, but uh, Ernie, you are a dear friend, um, and I read your analysis on the uh, Banyan uh, publication, and, and I always learn something new. Uh, and I think I will never forget the. Uh, cooperation that we did uh, in organizing the Indonesia conference, which was very, very well attended. Um, was it last year? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, again, so thank you very much for, is it this year? Yeah, this year. This year. I'm, I'm old, so like I lose it. <laughs> we're we're yeah. both in the same. Yes. So, again, thank you, and, and um, I hope anything that you need from me uh, from Jakarta, I'll always be uh, available, and uh, again, thank you for the great work that you've done in promoting CS, uh, America's relations with Asia, but particularly with uh, Indonesia. Thank, Thank you, Ernie. Thank you.